Hey friends, welcome to uh, my YouTube channel. I'm so honored that you're here. So glad to have you. If it's your first time, I just want to say welcome home. This is Weekly Bible Study with Vic Fomenko. And um, I'm glad that you're here. One thing I want to remind you to do, if you could just real quickly subscribe if you haven't, hit the bell for notifications and like this video. That's going to help YouTube know that this is great content and other people need to see this. But honored to have you. My name is Vic and I my passion is for the Word of God. I want to see people set free by the truth of God. I believe that if we know the truth, the truth will set us free, as Jesus said. So I'm excited to have you here this week. If you want to just take a minute and just share this uh, with someone um, so they can jump on and watch as well, that would be amazing. Well, let's jump into our uh, Bible study today. I'm excited to start a, a new series. Uh, we've been doing several different series on my YouTube channel here. Actually, if you want to check out and navigate the various things I've done on YouTube, you can just go uh, on my playlists. Um, so you go to my YouTube channel, go to playlists, and, and it's organized by playlist, and you'll be able to see the various series I've done. Most recently, I've wrapped up a series called Women uh, in Leadership or Women in Ministry. And so did a five-part series on that. Really good. Go check it out. But we're transitioning and we're doing a new kind of mini-series. And I want to talk about relationship with God. Relationship with God. I think the most important thing on planet Earth, the most important thing in the universe is actually relationships. The most important thing about life is relationships. And the most important one is the Lord. It's God. It's our Father. And so having not only a good relationship with God, but knowing the different types of relationships we can have with God can actually change us, transform us, and, and, and allow us to go deeper. I mean, I have not met a believer that hasn't said, you know, Vic, I want a deeper relationship with God. I want, I want more. I'm hungry for more. I want to know God. I want to know God deeper. I want to know God better. For believers that are out there that are joining me, you can probably relate to this desire of more of God. God has put within us a desire for more of him, a desire for intimacy, a desire for relationship. And so that's the subject of what we are talking about. So again, welcome to Weekly Bible Study. My name is Vic Fomenko. I'm your host. And we are talking about types of relationships with God. Types of relationships with God. Um, I also want to, from here, move into, you know, maybe a mini series on just relationships in general, kingdom relationships, kingdom friendships, types of relationships we can have on this earth, and then how to really do them well. I think the quality of our life is determined by how well we do relationships. The quality of your life, what you will experience on the earth is very much connected to relationships. So we're talking about relationships. It's a relationship series, but we want to start with our relationship with the Lord. Most people don't realize that you can actually have many types of relationships with God. You can have many aspects to your relationship with God. And that's what I want to dive deep into in our mini series and lesson and Bible study this time. So let me just start with this verse. It's a key verse for my life. It's John chapter 8, verse 32. And it says, you will know the truth and the truth will what? Set you free. Did you know, friend, that truth by itself doesn't set you free because truth exists. Truth is the Lord. He is the way, the truth, and the life, Scripture says. The Bible is truth. His word is truth. And it's available, it's well known, and yet a lot of people haven't been set free because it's not truth that sets you free. It's truth that you know that will set you free. So I'm, I'm believing that you are going to discover an aspect of God that you have not discovered before. You're going to discover an aspect of truth that you have not seen before. That's what I'm believing for. So Father, we just thank you for everyone tuning in. We thank you for the Spirit of God. Father, I just invite you into this Bible study, into this series. I invite 
invite you even in, even into the homes and the places, the headphones, the even the places where every single listener is. And I just declare, Father, would you visit us? Would you give us revelation? Would you give us insight? We want to go deeper with you. We want to know you. We want to tap into a deeper level of relationship, of intimacy, of friendship with God. And so we ask that, God, that we would know this truth, that it would not just be knowledge, it would be revelation, it'd be intimacy. So we just declare that over every single one that's listening, over every single one that's tuning in, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So I want to start with this idea. I want to start with this idea, and it's this. It's that the relationship with God is actually progressive. Did you know that? relationship with God is progressive. You can actually grow into different realms of relationship, different depths, different heights of relationship with God. And growth on this side of eternity, growth is both progressive and it's necessary. Growth is progressive and necessary. Science actually shows us very plainly that whatever's not growing is actually dying. Did you know that? You can explore even nature. Uh, the moment that you take, let's say, a piece of fruit or a vegetable and you remove it from the vine, you remove it from the branch, the moment it's disconnected from uh, the source, it's no longer growing. It immediately starts to die. We, we say that things have a certain shelf life. Like you can pull an ap apple off a tree, put it on the table and it has a shelf life that it'll last a certain amount of time before it starts to visibly die but eventually you'll start to see it start to wither die rot and disintegrate come back to what it came from which is earth from earth that came into earth it returns right and so but if you think about that the moment it's just disconnected from the source it starts to die and so when something's connected to its source it grows it develops it matures and then it's, when it's disconnected, it immediately starts to die. Whatever's not growing is dying. These are important principles. Why? Because we're talking about a growing, developing relationship with the Lord. Can I tell you that if your relationship with God is not growing, it's actually decreasing, that there's no, there's no cruise control in the kingdom. There's no cruise control in your relationship with God. You're either growing into deeper, intimate fellowship with the Lord, or you're actually kind of growing cold in and, and maybe distant in your fellowship. God is near. God is within us. God will never leave us or forsake us. So God never gets distant. But our connection, our fellowship, our sense of intimacy and nearness can grow distant and can grow cold. And we must maintain that. We must not only maintain it, but we must, we must burn. We must develop it. And so I'm even believing even for myself, like I'm longing for a deeper burning for the Lord. I don't just want to exist. I don't just want to take up space. I don't just want to get to the end of my life. Like I want to burn for the Lord. Are there those of you that have been longing to burn, to go deeper, to have different levels of encounter with the Lord? Can I tell you that your level of experience with the Lord, your level of encounter with the Lord is directly connected to your view of God and the type of relationship which you have with the Lord. I know so many believers that for years have tried to get closer to God and they've done everything they know how, but they've not been able to have encounters and experiences with the Lord. Why? Because they haven't grown into knowledge, into understanding, into the different levels and types of relationships we can have with the Lord. And so I want to show this to you. I think this is going to be such a key because everything on earth revolves around relationship. The most important thing in our existence is relationship. We came from intimacy. We came from relationship. We came from a community called the Godhead, the Trinity, and we're returning back to the Godhead, the Trinity, into marriage and union with him if we so desire that. That's what God, that's where we came from, and that's where we belong. And God's calling us back into that place, depth of fellowship with the Lord. So excited about this series, but Check this out. Do you know that Jesus, when he was on the earth, he also had to grow. He also had to develop and grow and mature. Jesus didn't wasn't born fully mature and fully like 
all in, right? He didn't like, wasn't just born and all of a sudden, bam, he's manifesting God likeness in every way. No, actually, Jesus grew up into that. Jesus had to grow. Jesus was a human, a physical man. He, Jesus is both God and man, right? The God man, Jesus Christ. Jesus was the name given to him as the man. Scripture says that you will call his name Jesus, right? But before he was called Jesus, he was the Christ. Christ is the divine part of him. J Jesus is the human part of him. And Jesus was born into humanity and he had to actually grow and develop. The human part of him had to grow and develop just as we are human and we must grow and develop. Luke chapter 2 verse 52, look what it says. It says, Jesus kept increasing. Did you know that until the day that Jesus died, he did not stop growing. Jesus kept increasing. And I love this translation, the New American Standard here, because it actually gets this verb tense right. Jesus didn't just increase into maturity and then stop maturing, but he continually increased and grew in maturity. Can I tell you that God has designed us to grow? Because if we're not growing, we're dying. Whatever is not growing is dying. So Jesus had to grow. Okay. He kept increasing. And notice the things Jesus increased in. He increased in wisdom. Well, where is wisdom? Wisdom is a faculty of, of your, of your soul, right? So Jesus grew mentally. He grew in wisdom. He grew in his mind, his will, his emotions. He grew in his emotional intelligence, in his, his, you know, uh, actual intelligence. So he grew in the soul because um, we're three parts. God is tripartite, Father, Son, Spirit. He created us tripartite, spirit, soul, body. So look, notice here in this verse, Luke 2.52, Jesus grew in wisdom. He also grew in stature. Well, what's stature? Stature is who we are physically. So that's his body. Jesus grew in stature, physical height, uh, in development, physical development. So he grew in his soul, wisdom. He grew in his body, stature, and he also grew in favor with God and with people. What? What is that about? Jesus grew in favor with God. Think about that for a moment. Did Jesus grow spiritually? Did he Jesus grow physically and in his soul and spiritually? Did he grow in favor with God and with people? Did he grow relationally in with God? And scripture is clear that Jesus grew in that way in favor with God. Wait, I thought God already had unlimited favor on Jesus when he was born. Well, clearly scripture actually points to this idea that Jesus needed to develop in favor. Jesus needed to develop. There were things that weren't fully mature that needed to mature. We're talking about growth, increase, and maturity because that's what our relationship with God is like. Look at this other passage of scripture. It's Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8. It says, although he was a son, this is referring to Jesus, although Jesus was a son, he learned. Jesus did what? He learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Jesus learned obedience. Wait, I thought Jesus was obedient right from a kid. Well, apparently he wasn't obedient to the level that he could have been. And this is actually very even clear. I mean, think about Jesus when he was uh, 12 years old and we have him, uh, you know, in the temple. And I mean, think about what Jesus did as a 12 year old. His parents were his guardians. They brought him to the temple. And three days later, they're leaving and Jesus doesn't go with them. Jesus, instead, he stays and he stays back in the temple and, and his parents Three days later, they find out they can't find him. They're frantic. They come back to Jerusalem. They're looking everywhere for Jesus. Mary finds him, and she's probably so upset, and he's in the temple, and, she's, and she rebukes Jesus. Jesus, why did you do this to us? Think about that. Was that obedient? Was that respectful? Was that honoring of his parents, of his earthly parents? I mean, yes, he honored his father in the temple. And he's like, didn't you, didn't you know I'm going to be about my father's business? So here's Jesus at the age of 12. 
knowing that his real father is his heavenly father, but he had to grow up into that knowledge. He had to, to grow up into the knowledge that he has a father that's not just earthly, but a heavenly father, and he wanted to be about his business. But it was the season for him to actually be honoring, reverent, respectful, and obedient to his earthly parents. So here Jesus is actually disrespectful, dishonoring, and not reverent or obedient really to his parents when he stays in the temple. Think about that. Think if your 12-year-old didn't tell you and just left and for three days you didn't know where they were. You would rebuke them and correct them. Well, if, if they're perfect, if they're God, and if they make no mistakes, then why would you need to correct or rebuke? No, because Jesus made mistakes. It was a mistake for Jesus to not do that because look at what, look at what Scripture says there. In, 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 when Jesus went to the temple, it says that, and then from then on, he went and he he obeyed his parents, or he, um, from that point on, he honored his parents. He he went and obeyed them, respected them. So his mom comes and corrects him, and Jesus has to learn <coughs> obedience. So there's a development process to Jesus, right, that he has. You can explore that deeper. Go check out those scriptures, but it's very, very fascinating there. But Jesus learns obedience and he kept increasing. So as long as he was on this planet, he kept growing and increasing. I mean, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is about to die, this is the day he was crucified, the night before. He says, God, not my will, but yours be done. Like I surrender to you. Jesus constantly was surrendering. He never quit surrendering. Think about this. Jesus had to grow. Guess what? If Jesus had to grow, then we must grow. How much more we must grow if Jesus had to grow? Let's take a look at a couple passages of Scripture here. Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. It says this, but grow. Grow. In what? in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We must actually grow. Now, 2 Peter is written to believers, and this is the second letter that Peter actually wrote. So think about it. These are already believers, and they're not fully mature yet. They must grow. What are they growing in? You can grow in grace, and you can grow in knowledge. Jesus grew in grace, favor with God, and with man. Go figure. Jesus grew in favor with God. Why? Because he was still learning obedience. I mean, if he did God have more favor on him when he learned obedience even to the point of death? Yes. There is a pleasure of God that can continually increase as you mature. So it's not like God is like mad or displeased at you when you're a child, but there's a there's an expectation for growth, okay? So we must grow. Scripture clearly says grow in grace. Look at what Colossians 1 verse 10 says so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. You may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way so that there's there's ways where we must continually please God. And I've talked in an earlier series about, you know, pleasing God is God displeased with us. And, and the answer is kind of, it's always twofold. It's like, yes, he's pleased with us, but we can bring God more pleasure, right? Because a mature son grows. But if a, if a son continues to stay in infancy, that's not normal. That's crippled. That's not, that's not pleasing to the Lord, right? He's pleased with us, but our behavior, our lack of growth can be displeasing, right? And look, bear fruit in every good work, growing, growing in the knowledge of God. Okay? Huge here. Uh, look at... Look at a couple other passages here. Look at Hebrews chapter 5, 12 through 14. In fact, though, by this time, so there's a time where there was an expectation for them to be mature already. By this time, right? You ought to be teachers, and yet you need someone to teach you elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. What is milk for? Who's milk for? An infant. I have a three-month-old infant. Her name is Emmy. She's our second. I have an eight-year-old and a three-month-old, and she needs milk. I can't give her solid food. It would kill her. She needs milk. 
because solid food is for the mature, milk is for the young. And Paul and the writer here in Hebrew says, by this time you should be teaching others, and yet you have to be taught what? Elementary things, foundational things. Can I tell you, if you don't nail the elementary things, you'll never grow up into maturity. We're talking about relationship with God and growing. Can I tell you that many, many people in their relationship with God they're very elementary and immature, and so they don't actually have intimacy with the Lord. They have a relationship with God that actually is very immature, and it's not deep. It's not full. It's not fulfilling. If you have not been fulfilled in your relationship with God, can I tell you, it's because maybe we need to grow up into all things, into maturity, into fullness, into the full relationship and revelation of God. Your intimacy with God is directly connected to your growth and to your maturity. When you're mature, it's easy to come right into the presence of God. When your mind sets right, your mind is renewed, you know the Lord, you know who he is, you just come straight to him. You come straight to the Father. You come straight into intimacy. You come straight into hearing his voice. But when you're immature, you're not really sure what God's like. You're struggling. You might just see God as as judge, as, you know, as master, as kind of controller, as kind of like you're a slave. You must do what he says. You might see God in a way that's not a complete picture of who God is. Can I tell you right now that my three month old does not have a complete picture of who I am? She knows me in one way, and that's basically like in the state of like control, really, because she's in an age where it's like, I have to, you know, my, my wife and I, we control her diet, her sleep, her habits, where she is in the house, what she's doing. She's so dependent on us. And she only knows us at that level of relationship. But as she grows and matures, she can develop new realms and levels and types of relationships with us that she has no idea about right now. Can I tell you, the longing you have for more of God is not connected to God holding himself back. It's not connected to you still being like unclean or in sin or this and that. It's actually connected to your growth and maturity in Christ. And can I tell you even actually your freedom from sin is actually connected to your revelation of knowing who he is and then knowing who you are in him. I know mature Christians even that have known God for a long time, but they only know God as master. They only know God as judge. They only know God as like out there and distant, but they don't know God deep and intimately. And so they're still struggling with things because they don't know who they are and they don't really know who God is. And look at this. It's, it's about time. By this time, it's time to mature. It's time to move on. It's time to grow in depth. And so I'm just, I'm releasing that. I'm declaring that over every single person watching. It's your time to grow up into the things of God. And I believe that even this teaching and these truths are not only going to give you the knowledge, are not only going to give you the revelation in scripture, but they're going to give you a heart and a desire. Are you going to burn for the things of the Lord? Are you going to desire him? You're going to want him. You're going to go into depth because it's time. By this time, we ought to be so intimate with the Lord. We ought to be in the highest levels of relationship with him, which we'll talk about. But yet, sometimes we're still immature. And Paul, even in Corinthians, he says, man, you're so fleshly still. You're such carnal Christians. You're, you're, um, in Corinthians, I'm going to find the passage real quick. You are carnal uh, Christians. I'm finding this passage here. It's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'll show it, you, show it to you here. This is so important, 1 Corinthians 3. verses one through nine. Check it out. And I have it here in the New American Standard, the ESV and the NIV. It says, and I, brothers and sisters, could not speak to you as spiritual, but only as fleshly, as infants in Christ. Right? NIV says, I could not address you as people, as mature, right? 
who live by the Spirit, but as people who are worldly, mere infants in Christ, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you still are not ready. You are still worldly or fleshly, still of the flesh, right? Since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For one says, I follow Paul, another Apollos, this and that. And he goes on and he says this, but look at this. Um, he's talking about laying a foundation as a wise builder, someone else building on it. So there is a building and a development. There is a growth and your work, your growth will be revealed with fire. And if what you have built survives, you'll be rewarded. But if what you have built is burned up, you will suffer loss. But you yourself will be saved, even as one barely escaping the flames of fire. But you yourself will be saved. But your work, what you've done, because of your immaturity, it's going to be your works will be burned up when it comes to the end. I could not give you solid food. I had to speak to you as fleshly, as carnal, as immature. Are you seeing that? The same thing happening here in Hebrews. By this time, you ought to have grown up. You need, you, you need milk, not solid food. Look, anyone who lives on milk, being an infant, still an infant, is not acquainted with teachings about righteousness. They don't know their identity. They don't know their righteousness because when you know your righteousness, you will live righteously. Man, look at this. This is so powerful. This is a whole other lesson, but... The teaching about righteousness, not understanding our righteousness is what keeps us as an infant. But solid food is for who? It's for the mature who by constant use train themselves to distinguish good from evil. So there is a growing up. We must grow, but grow in grace and knowledge growing into the knowledge of God. By this time, we ought to not be infants, but we must be mature, trained, growing, right? Look at Hebrews 6, 1. Leaving elementary teaching about Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from works and of faith towards God and on and on he goes, but we need to go past the foundation and grow up. Can I tell you many believers are still in the foundation stages of their relationship with God. They really don't understand real depths of intimate relationship with God. They're still in the foundation stages. Can I tell you this? Before we can have deeper levels of relationship with God, we must first lay the foundation and understand and master the foundational ones. You cannot graduate to the next higher, deeper, greater level until you first have graduated the elementary levels. Think about it with school. If you don't pass elementary, you can't go to middle school. If you don't do well in middle school, you can't go on to high school. You can't go on to college to graduate school, right? Th there's levels of maturity. And if you don't pass the test, you must take the test again, right? Look at Ephesians chapter 4, 12 through 4, 15. It talks about how, verse uh, 12 talks about how Christ, when he ascended, he gave gifts to men. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Five things right. Why? For the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain unity and the knowledge of the Son of God up to a mature man. We must grow up. This is talking to believers. I mean, I have met believers that think that when they got saved and they're in Christ, they're fully, fully mature, ready to go, complete, full, lacking nothing. And they're already mature. They're sanctified. They're perfect. They're holy. And they think they have no development or growth to go. And that's really a misunderstanding because in one sense, yes, that is true. In one sense, we have been saved. We're dead to sin. We're alive to God. We're mature. We're perfect. We're just like Christ right? We've, we are grown up. We, we're perfect as he is perfect. But where is that reality true? It's true in the spirit. 
But in our soul, our mind, will, and our emotions, we must grow up into all things. We must manifest that Christ-likeness that's already in us. It's in our spirit, but our soul must be renewed. Our mind must be renewed. We must be continually renewed day by day so that we can actually manifest the Christ-likeness that's already on the inside of us. So look what Ephesians 4, 12 through 15 says. We must all attain until... Right, so we're, there, these gifts, these fivefold gifts—apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher—are going to continue until we all attain unity of the faith, knowledge, and a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So we're going to keep growing until we look like Christ in every way. We must look like Christ. Whoever claims to live in God must live like Jesus did. That's 1 John 2, verse, verse 6. Whoever claims to live in God must live like Jesus. Check it out. I'm going to switch back over here to the browser. 1 John 2, 6. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. If we claim to live in him, we must look like Jesus. We must, we must look like Jesus. We can look like Jesus. The biggest, one of the biggest lies we believe as believers is that we will always be immature, falling and stumbling, and we won't look like Jesus. We're going to continually try, but we're always going to fail. Can I tell you, that's a lie. We must move on from that. We must grow up, right? And, and no longer be children. Look at verse 14. We're in Ephesians 4, 12 through 14, 12 through 15. Verse 14, as a result, we are no longer children tossed here and there by waves carried around by wind of doctrine, with trickery, craftiness, deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up. We're to grow up into all aspects into him who is the head that is Christ. We're supposed to grow up into Christ. We're supposed to look like him. Can I tell you, just as Jesus grew, we're supposed to grow. And we're supposed to grow in our level of friendship and fellowship and intimacy with him. We must grow. The desire in each of us, we want more of God. The, the desire is for us to grow. And I tell you that you can't grow unless you really know him deeply. Jesus said, this is eternal life that you may know me. Hosea 4, 6 says that my people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. What we don't know is killing us. We must grow in knowledge. 1 Peter 2.2 2 says, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. We've been saved already, but we need to grow up in our salvation and manifest our salvation so we look like Jesus in every way. We are on a journey of growth. If you're not growing, you're dying. And as we grow, we attain higher levels of relationship with God. You might think like, Vic, what are you talking about? Higher levels of relationship with God? I thought we're either in relationship or we're not. That's not totally true. My daughter, Emmy, who is three months old, she's in relationship with me, but there are higher levels of relationship with me. Like my wife, for example, has a higher level of relationship with me than my daughter who's eight years old, than my daughter who's three years old, than my friend that I've known for for years, then my family member, then my mom or dad, then um, my siblings, my spouse, my wife has a higher level of relationship. There is a deeper, higher level of relationship. We can have as much of God as we want. We can have depth. We can have intimacy with God. And I know that's what you're longing for, my friend. That's what I'm longing for. I want more of God. I want more and more and more of God. I'm, I'm uh, pulling up a quote here. The greatest paradox of love is that, is this. Um, finding this quote, the greatest paradox of love is that even though we have him, we continue to want him more. I'm trying to find it here. Um, the more we have, the more we want. 
can't I can't quite find it. But I think C.S. Lewis might have said it. Let me let me search for that. This is such a good quote. It's worth adding here to my notes. Paradox of love, C.S. Lewis. Maybe it's actually um, A.W. Tozer. Ah, there it is. To have found God and still pursue him is our soul's paradox of love. To have found God and yet still pursue him. I'm going to throw it in here. This is A.W. Tozer. I love it. So we have God, and yet we're constantly pursuing him. And that is what love's all about. I, I have found my wife, and yet that's not enough for me. I still want to continually pursue her. I have found God, and yet I want him more. I want him more and more and more. And the more we drink, the more we want. The more we're filled with him, the more we want him. And that is the power of loving God. That's the power of love is that even though we have, we're not filled. We desire more. So good. So as we grow, we attain higher levels of relationship with God. Let me put it to you like this. Every earthly relationship that we have on this earth actually reflects a type of relationship that we can have with God. Think about it. God in his wisdom gave us several earthly relationships. God in his wisdom and his sovereignty and his divinity and his beauty and his majesty on the earth gave us many types of earthly relationships. Why did he do that? Can I tell you, every earthly relationship we have actually is actually a temporary relationship. All the relationships you have on earth are temporary. They're not going to come with you in eternity in one sense. Like it's going to change, but they're temporary. Why did God create us on this earth and give us many different types of temporary relationships? Because each of the relationships we have on the earth actually reflects and speaks to a type of relationship we can have with God. And this is the longing that we have for him. All human relationships are temporary, but they get, they're they given so we can better relate to God. Earthly relationship is a picture. Every earthly relationship is a picture of a different side of the type of intimacy and relationship and fellowship we can have with God. So with that, let's actually take a look at five types of human relationships, or actually these are five types of relationships we can have with God. So they're human, but they're also, since God created them, we can also have these five types of relationships with him. So there are five earthly relationships and there are five relationships that relate to God. Let's start with uh, the first one here, a child. You know that when you're born on this earth, the very first relationship that you have is a child. Like my daughter, who Emmy, who is um, three months old, she only knows this one thing, and she is basically a child. She knows she she basically knows that she's a kid, and she is dependent and fully dependent on on us, her parents. Like, why does God give us children? Why does God allow us that the first the first thing that we ever become is a child. The first thing that we know is a child. Why? Because that's the beginning. And if you don't become a child, you can't actually grow up and be an adolescent, a teen, a young adult, an adult, you know, mature, and on and on and on. If, you, if you're not a child, you can't actually grow up. So think about a child. Why does God give us this relationship? Because why? Because we have that relationship with him. Just as we are human, as earthly children, we actually are children of God. So look at John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as have received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. 
those that receive him become children of God. We're born from God, but we need to be born again into the family of God and become children of God. Why did God allow us to be children on this earth? Because he wanted us to know what it's like to be a child of God, because we are designed to become children of God, right? The first relationship you can have with God as a child. And can I tell you, a lot of believers are still stuck in this place where they're basically like a child. They need God for everything. They're so dependent on God and they're needing and they're always asking and they're always needing and they're all of their prayers are only petitions like they haven't ever graduated to a different level of relationship with God. Now, can I tell you when it comes to our relationship with God, we never grow out of being a child. And so there's a, there's an element where we're a child of God and we're always going to be a child. But yet still being a child, we're supposed to mature into other forms of relationships. If we're only a child of God, then we'll be very immature, will be very childlike, will be very child, not child, just childlike, but childish, will be needing. I mean, think about it. If, you're, if your kid is like, like my daughter who is eight, if she's still asking for me to take her to the bathroom, for me to give her a drink of water, for me to feed her, spoon feed her, for me to do everything for her, that's not going to be a pleasing relationship. That's not going to be a fun relationship. And yet many people, they never grow out of childishness. And I mean, we looked at it, those several verses that say like, it's time for us to grow up into maturity. It's time for us to become, uh, to, to, to grow up into, into greater things, into deeper things. And yet we still often have not grown up. We're still children. But he's given us the right to become children, but we don't stay children. We must grow up. So think about the various types of relationships we can have on earth. We can have a child. Why? Because we become children of God. Think about another type of relationship we can have on earth. It's a sibling. Why does God give us siblings on the earth? Because we are actually siblings with him. Why does God allow us to experience what it's like to be a sibling, right? Because check this out, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, uh, 11 and 12 says this, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them, who's them, family, brothers and sisters. Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. So Jesus is saying to, to, to God the Father, I'm going to tell about your name to my brothers and sisters. Jesus has called us his siblings. Why did God give us that relationship on this earth? Because we become siblings with God. Can you believe and imagine that? We're not only God's children, but we're siblings. Can I tell you that right now, Emmy, right now she just understands a child. She doesn't understand what a sibling is. She has a sibling, but they don't really have a sibling relationship because she hasn't matured into that. You have to actually mature into a sibling relationship. Right. And so when she matures, they're actually going to be able to relate as siblings, as brother and sister, or as sister and sister. Right. Then what's the next? I mean, uh, take a look at another scripture here. It's Romans chapter eight, verse 12. It says, check this out. Uh, Romans eight, eight, 29. Sorry. Romans eight, 29. Those who God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that by the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, Jesus it became the firstborn of many brothers and sisters, Adelphos. That's the word, Adelphos. That's the word, brothers and sisters is the way that it's translated here. It's one word in the original, but it means brothers and sisters. So we see that he's the firstborn among many brothers or brothers and sisters. So geez, we're in the family of God and we have a relationship with God. Do you know that you can mature? in your intimacy with the Lord, where you're no longer just a child that's dependent on him and is only asking and begging and needing, but actually where you're like, you have a relationship like a sibling does, where there's a closeness and an intimacy that like sisters can have, like sisters can grow up and actually brothers and sisters can grow up in, in that place. There's, there's a deep level of 
of intimacy here that's shared among siblings that's not shared among other relationships. So that's the type of relationship we can have with God. Now, another relationship God gives us on earth, there's friend. Now, these are people that we're not really related to physically, but they can be our friends. So like my daughter, London, she's eight, and she has in her life friendships that are not her siblings. They're maybe like cousins or distant friends, but they're her friends and she wants to be around them. Now, she's probably always going to be closer to her sister when her sister grows up and they can be friends. But she still has this relationship called a friend. And a friend can develop actually pretty deep depending on the level of surrender, the level of openness, the level of trust. But a friend is another layer and type of relationship with we, that we can have. Now, why does God allow us on the earth to have friendships? Why? Because he is our friend. Look at what Proverbs 3.32 says. He, God, offers his friendship to who? To the godly. The friendship of God is for the godly. So you can be a child of God without being godly in one sense. I mean, in our spirit, we're godly, but you don't have, but you could like act ungodly and still be a child of God. You can be a sibling of God. You can be in the family of God. You can be a brother and sister of God. He declares you as his brother and sister and yet not be godly. But a deeper level of intimacy with God is a friendship with God. He offers his friendship to the godly. Look at what Job's, Job 29 verse 4 says. Oh, the days when I was in, in my prime, when God's intimate friendship blessed my house. There was an intimate friendship of God that was over the house of Job. And Job longs for that connection with God because uh, Job in Job 29, he was actually experiencing some things and he actually does not see God correctly. He sees God no longer as friend, but he sees God as an unjust punisher, as an unjust judge that basically is like abandoning him and is persecuting him and is destroying him. And Job so wrongly saw God that later on in chapter 41 and chapter 42, Job actually repents. And he says, I didn't know what I was talking about because he was seeing God incorrectly. And he, he was longing for a day of intimate friendship with God, not realizing that he still had God that way and that life circumstances painted God in a way that hurt him and he no longer wanted to be the friend of God. Can I tell you, there's many people that have been hurt by God and they no longer want to be close to him. They don't want to be like a child. They don't want to talk to him. They don't want to be a sibling. They don't want to be a friend of God. Kind of like Job was hurt by life circumstances lost his family, lost his health, lost his stuff, lost everything seemed like. And he no longer, he was saying things against God that were just ridiculous. You can go check it out in Job, the multiple things Job says against God. And man, he's got such a view, a bad view of God based on life's experiences that he has to repent of later for. But we can have a friendship with God. His friendship is to the godly. Job longed for that friendship with God that he tapped into, but then he came out of that because of a wrong view of God. Can I tell you, your view of God will determine your intimacy with him. Your view of God will determine your intimacy with him. So important. Your view of God will determine your intimacy with him. Take a look at Luke chapter 12, verse 4. Now I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. After that, have nothing. Uh, they can do nothing more than that, right? So I say to you, who? I say to you, my friends. Jesus called his disciples friends. I say to you, my friends. Look at what um, Psalm 25, verse 14, it says, the friendship of God is for those who fear him. The friendship of God is for those who fear him. I love it in uh, the, the Living Bible. It says the friendship of God is reserved for those who, ha who reverence him. With them alone, he shares the secrets of his promise. Wow, that is so powerful. That word for fear of God, that word for yare, the fear of God, it actually means the reverence or honor of God. There's two sides to that word and I actually do a whole series on the fear of God. And so, so many people misunderstand the fear of God. You know what Jesus did? He quoted the Old Testament and he used that word yare, but he quoted it in, the, in, in his language and he changed 
the word that he used because people so misunderstood the fear of God where he actually translated the fear of God and he said it's actually the worship of God or the reverence of God. That the worship of God is the fear of the Lord. Wow, to fear God is to worship him. If you haven't checked out that series, go check out that series. Go to YouTube on my playlists and go and find Nature of God series or the Fear of God series actually. And it's right in there too. It's in both. Nature of God is a long series. Fear of God is like, I think a three or four part series, but such a powerful revelation. It can change your whole world. But look at this. The friendship of God is for those that honor him, those that worship him, those that revere him, those that want to go into deeper depths of him. Can I tell you, you will not tap into higher levels of intimacy with God unless you understand adoration, worship, looking at him and ministry to the Lord. Worship. Worship and ministry to the Lord unlock deep levels of friendship with God. I'm writing it right here in the notes so you guys can see this. But there is a depth of worship and intimacy you can have with God. A tap into a friendship with God that only happens through worship. Not through terror, not through fear of punishment, not through judgment, but a worship of God. So powerful. The friendship of God for those who fear him. I love it in the Living Bible. Friendship with God is reserved for those who reverence him. Reverence, honor, worship. With them alone, he shares the secrets of his promises. Another translation actually says that the secrets of God are for those who fear him or honor him, worship him. The secrets of God, the deep things of God. The depths of God. You know that there's depths to God? There's immeasurable depths to God. And those are not reserved just for children. They're not just reserved for siblings. They're not just reserved for friends. They're reserved for for a deep level of friendship with God. Because you can have levels of friendship and intimacy with God. Take a look at a couple of more passages here. We're going to transition here. Man, we're running out of time. I really want to get into some of the, some of this stuff here. Maybe we can do continue this series as well. I know we're going to do just a series on friendship and relationship with God because I think this is what life is all about. Depth with God. How do we cultivate depths with God? Look at Romans chapter 5, 10 through 11. I love this in the Good News translation, the GNT. It says, we were God's enemies. Why? Because we were separated with God because of our sin, because of because we chose, we rejected him. We were separated with God. We were enemies with God. But he made us his friends or reconciled us. That word for reconciled, it means that he brought us into friendship. He made us his friends through the death of his son. Now that we are God's friends, how much more will we be saved by Christ's life? But that is not all. We rejoice because of what God has done through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has now made us God's friends. Before we were enemies, but now we're friends. Before we were just children, we were just siblings. But now there's a depth of friendship with God because of the cross, because of the blood, because of the finished work. We can tap into this. This is our inheritance. This is what we're supposed to tap into. Now, let's move on to a fourth type of human relationship or that God created for us on this earth that's temporal, but but it's it's a it's a symbol in a way that God God gave us marriage. Why did God give us marriage on the earth? Why did God give us children on the earth? Because God wanted to show us a level of intimacy with Him that's deeper than a child, deeper than a sibling, deeper than just a friend, but a spouse. Can I tell you that there's no marriage in heaven? You're not going to be married to someone. Jesus himself said it when he was talking to the Sadducees and Pharisees. He said that you're so mistaken. You don't know about it. Like that guy that died and seven of them died. They were married to that one woman. Like none of them are going to be married to her in heaven. You don't understand. And he, Jesus said, like, we're going to be like the angels. We're not going to have like a physical gender and like have a physical relationship with the spouse. But why did God give us a temporary relationship on earth cut? called marriage. Why did God create us as sexual beings? God didn't have to create us that way. You know that there's actually like 
um, creatures that can actually reproduce asexually. They're asexual, like angels are asexual. Um, I think the uh, snail is asexual. They can actually reproduce more snails without having sexual intimacy, right? But why did God create humans as sexual beings? Why? Because there's a level of our sexuality and intimacy that's actually an image of intimacy with God. I don't want to be crude. I don't want to be vulgar, but this is how God designed it. God designed marriage. God designed a man and a woman. He designed our bodies, even the parts of our bodies. Why? To, to, to fit together, to be one. Why? Because there's a level of intimacy in marriage that God ordained and designed. It's not dirty. It's not crass. It's not, it's not bad. You know, it's, it's, it's sacred. It's private, but it's not shameful. It's beautiful. It's created by God. Why did God create sexuality? Why did God create sex? Why did God create man and woman? Why did God create marriage? This is all a picture and a, a shadow of our t relationship with God. Why does throughout the Bible, God uses like a seed and a sower, he uses our heart like seed or like our heart, like the, 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 the soil and his word like seed. Jesus is the word and he's like seed and the seed comes into us and it produces new life. Can I tell you that in the natural, unless the seed from man comes into a woman, it will never produce new life. Unless the seed of God comes into us, we're not going to produce new life. We must eat of him. We must partake of him. We must become one with him. Now, all of these earthly things are pictures. All of these words I'm saying are images or pictures of a type and a shadow of a relationship we can have with him. We can have a relationship with God like spouses have, where it's beyond children, it's beyond siblings, it's beyond friendship, it's be it's it's a spouse, it's intimacy, it's 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 even romantic. It's intimate beyond anything else it's designated for marriage it's unique for marriage there's a type of intimacy we can have with god that's it's it's a it's a higher level and and very few people tap into this into the bridal chambers with god into the marriage supper of the lamb into the into that type of intimacy why do we even have the whole entire book of song of solomon written if you take a look at it one of my favorite ways to read it is in the passion translation in the tpt the passion translation it's so intimate it's so beautiful but it's written there it's written between a a, a man and his woman a a guy you know that wants his woman and later becomes his wife, but he's longing for her and he's talking about her in, in, in an intimate way, in, in, a, in, a, in a physical way, in an emotional way, in a soulish way, in a, in a way that he's like desiring her, but it's actually an image of God desiring us. This is the way God pursues us. If you could read Song of Solomon as God speaking this towards you, it will change your world. Unless you see God in this intimate, deep way until like, like that, like that sexuality between a husband and a wife doesn't become weird when it comes to you and God, you will not be able to tap into the depths of intimacy with God. I'm telling you, there's a level of intimacy. Like when a man and a woman are having intimacy with one another in a physical way, if they can't bring God into that, that means there's still a level of shame and guilt attached to that where they think they're doing something wrong. If you can't bring God into that, if you can't bring worship music into that, if you can't bring the presence of the Lord and talking to the Lord into that place, then maybe there's still shame connected to things where what God created to be beautiful and a reflection of him is still distant and we don't really get it. Again, I'm not trying to like offend or be crass or be rude, but why did God create this temporary spouse relationship on earth? Because it's a type and a shadow of the intimacy we can have with God. Why did God put Song of Solomon in the Bible? Because it's, it's a type and a shadow of the relationship and intimacy we can have with God. Many people are uncomfortable with God as a lover, with God, with the, with the kisses of his mouth. This, this says in scripture, I will kiss you with the kisses of my mouth. Many people are very, very weirded out and don't understand the intimacy that they can have with God. And we're not talking about something that's physical. We're talking about something that's 
experiential. We can experience God in such a deep, deep, powerful way, like Song of Solomon, like a marriage relationship, like a covenant that's sealed with with vows and then sealed with this intimate relationship that's on earth, it's physical and it's temporary, but in heaven, it's eternal, it's beautiful. And even right now with God, we can have it beautiful. Like God invented sexuality. Why? It's a type of relationship we can have with God. He wouldn't give it to us on earth if it was dirty or wrong. It was invented by God to show us our fellowship with God. I hope you're seeing this. I hope you're getting this. We're talking about types of relationship with God. And now I'm taking this earthly type and spiritualizing it to actually an experience and encounter with him that's, that's deeper than a human marriage. Look at how scripture writes about this. It's Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ. The same image of a husband and a wife is the same image of Christ. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might present her to himself, the church, in all her glory, having no spot and no wrinkle. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to the one husband. I promised you to the one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him present you to him as a pure virgin. This is so powerful. Look at in Revelation, it says, let's rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him because the marriage of the lamb has come. The marriage of the lamb, we are going to be married to God. His bride has prepared herself. Who's the bride? We're the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. This is the type of intimacy we can have with God. And then the final relationship we can have with God, and we're going to wrap it up here because and then we're going to go into levels of relationship and intimacy. We're going to go, we're going to take this deeper um, next time in part two, but another relationship we can have on earth that God wants us to have is parent, a loving, nurturing, providing, protecting parent. God is identified as our father 265 times in scripture, our father. Look at Isaiah 64, but now Lord, you are our father. We're the clay, you're the potter, you're our potter. It's so intimate. Clay and potter, they were intimately, like the potter touched the clay with his hand. There was such an intimacy. There was such a depth there. We are the work of your very hands. It says, by his hands, he formed us. The potter that touches the clay and forms it with his hands. That's the intimacy and depth of a father and his child. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It pleases God for him to be your father and to give you the kingdom. Matthew 7, 11, if you, despite being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father, if you know how to do good things, how much more is your father good? Your father in heaven will give good things. He's a good father. Romans 8, 15 says, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so you'll live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought your adoption to sonship. By him we cry, Abba, Father. He's our Father. Why did God give us these human relationships that are temporary? We're not going to be parents in heaven. We're not going to be spouses in heaven. We're not going to be children in heaven in eternity with God. We're going to have all of these relationships with God and we can have them now. Why did God allow us to be parents? So that we can peer into his heart of how he sees us. When I look at my little daughter, Emmy, who's three months old, and I love her so much. I love her cooing and I love her smiles. I love her tongue. I love her face. I just want to kiss her. I want to hold her. She's my girl. She hasn't done anything. All she does is cry and sleep and eat and poop and changed her. And there's there's nothing but her in her mind. But I love her. God allowed me to peer into his heart of how he loves us before we do anything. While we're still sinners, Christ died for us. He allows us to peer into that. But we must grow into each of these types and shadows of relationships. Without the former, you can't have the latter. Each relationship must be grown into. You can have depths of relationships with God How you view God will determine how you will experience God.
I want to end there and we're going to go into talking about different levels of relationship. Are you seeing God as a servant, as a master, or as a friend? And we're going to talk about the five levels of relationship that we can grow into and how to grow into them. So we're going to do that next time, but this is so deep. I'm asking, I'm going to ask the Lord to give you in-depth revelation on this. Father, I'm asking you, will you give us more revelation into friendship and intimacy with you that we would go from just being a child to siblings, to friend, to spouse, to lover, to understanding your heart of a father towards us, Lord. Give us these depths of intimacy with you. Let us grow from go from glory to glory in the name of Jesus. Man, thank you so much for joining me. I love you guys. You guys are amazing. Thanks for your comments. Thanks for your likes. Subscribe. I'd love to interact with you. Please leave your questions and stuff. Um, before I go, I also want to just... Um, give you an opportunity to uh, re really become a partner with our ministry. I want to ask you, would you consider becoming a partner with our ministry? I do ministry full-time. I'm not paid um, by the church. I'm really supported. My wife and I are supported by partners like you. And we're, we want to do this. We want to continue to do this. We're actually even going to be launching a school of ministry. And our, you know, our church is growing and developing. And I'm, I want to do a lot of things. I'm currently in the process of writing my first book. I'm so excited about that. But to do all of these things and more, we really rely on friends and partners like you that give one time or become a monthly partner. So I just wanted to say, if this is a blessing to you, if this is an encouragement to you, you can be a partner with us. You can go to my website, vicfomenko.com forward slash donate. It'll redirect you to my church's website. And you can, in the drop down menu, select Vic and Anastasia Fomenko. When you select our names there, that those funds will go to our us and our ministry. Um, you can also use Cash App or Venmo if you don't care about necessarily getting a, a donation receipt. Those are easy ways. You can also be a partner or give one time, but those are ways you can give. We would love to grow our partnerships so that we can actually be a blessing to the body of Christ so that we can write more books, do more schools, travel more, and not have to take any money from anyone, but really be a blessing and, and, and sow into the kingdom of God. So if God calls you to, to be a partner, just take a minute and ask him, Lord, like, is this something that you want me to do? Do you want me to partner with Vic, his ministry? Do you want me to become a monthly partner? And if he leads you to do that, we would be honored. Thank you so much, friends. I want to see you next week. I, I, I go live and I go on, online and I teach weekly. And so if this is a blessing for you. Again, would you please like? Would you subscribe? Would you share? Would you hit the bell for notifications? And join me again next week. I can't wait to see you soon. God bless you guys.